I'm Steve Wirt, uh, Swirt on Drupal. Uh, fit kind of a role of developer, tech lead, technical architect, somewhere in that ballpark depending on the project. Uh, I've worked in the past in terms of the government space on currently the, the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, Department of Justice, Department of Education, FCC, a couple others I can't mention publicly. Uh, been on Drupal for a little while, and I'm an imposter. I hope there's a few others in the room. Uh, why I'm an imposter, there's a number of reasons for that. There isn't enough therapy in the world for it. Uh, but particularly why I'm an imposter giving a presentation about documentation is I do not feel like my documentation of the site I'm currently working on is 100%. Is there anybody in the room who's got a site that they're involved with that the documentation is like, boom, tops? No. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. No. no shame. If you've got one, you know, be proud of it. <laughs> All right. Uh, documentation is hard. It's kind of like testing. Like, you just never feel like there's enough of it or never enough of the, you know, test coverage, never enough documentation coverage. So I kind of think of them in very similar, uh, similar brain, uh, regions as that. Um, but so a lot of the examples that I'm going to use are specifically for my current project, Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, but some of it is wisdom I've learned along the way uh, in some of these other projects as well. Uh, so in general, your site shouldn't be like a game of Clue. It was Colonel Conlon in the terminal with a dress command. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be. Go see Miss Middaw if you want to talk about permissions, right? She's the, she's the guru on the project that knows all about permissions. Oh, article content types, you want to see Mrs. Washburn, right? She's the expert there. That shouldn't be how your teams and your sites run if they're running like smoothly. It shouldn't be that we have a, a group of experts that you have to go consult with uh, because you never know what, what, what may happen. Uh, so from, from my point of view, documentation ought to be, you know, the, the same kind of stuff, who, why, when, where, what, how. Uh, we're going to expand it out a little bit, like who should document, why should you document, when should you document, where should you document, notice a pattern here, what should you document, and how can Drupal help you document that. Right, hopefully we'll connect that dot so it's a little bit about Drupal as well. <clears throat> who should document? Raise your hand if you've got an alphabet soup of people that work with you on your team. Right? PO, Dev, DM, SME, right? Uh, content strategist, that's CS. Uh, everybody in that alphabet soup should be helping to document the site. And so then the question becomes well, how can we make that possible so that they can all be involved with documenting the site? Uh, why document? First one, sites grow. Every site starts out simple. There's two nice little content types. Everything's just an easy dream, right? You don't really have to like document anything because it's just so simple. And then you get a business requirement and another one and another one. And pretty soon you have, especially in the government space, you have this like sort of monster of a site that has all of these exceptions and things and we need to document that. Uh, people forget, right? I don't know if you can tell, but my memory full indicator is, you know, at the far end of that range, right? The, the whiter my hair gets, the less I can remember. So, uh, right, we forget things. We lose track of things. Uh, and the last one, team changes, right? Today's team is not tomorrow's team, right? I, you know, I, in terms of people leave, contracts get, like, cut down in size, so people have to leave. Bad things happen to people, people disappear. Uh, you know, whatever the case may be, the team you have now is not the team you will have next year uh, or even in the next six months. And so we document for that reason as well. Uh, when should you document? Right? When your planning starts, ideally. Right? As soon as you start planning a site, the best way to, to plan and to like document what's coming and why you've made decisions you've made is at the very start. Uh, as you build the MVP, when you iterate on that MVP, and the MVP becomes version two, version six, version, who knows, we've lost count of the versions. Um, whenever pitfalls are found. Oh, we found this weird thing. Uh, when workarounds are found. We found this great thing. Uh, when guidance or processes are created, right, as the site gets bigger, you start to put in a little bit more governance and things like that. 
Uh, and from my point of view, whenever you've had to answer the same question twice. You've had to answer it twice, you wrote it down the first time, you could just send a link for the second question. I'm lazy like that. No, scratch that, I'm efficient like that. Uh, where should you document? Well, here's a whole slew of choices. Right, Word, Google Doc, uh, those can be nice. They're a nice place to start. Um, sometimes there's issues, especially in the government space, where certain government contracts, you can't use Google Documents. You don't have access to them, whatever. There's certain restrictions like that sometimes. A wiki, uh, wikis are often provided by whether you're using GitLab or GitHub, or there's oftentimes a wiki that can adjoin that. Might be a decent place for documentation. Uh, you could put Markdown in the repo, in the same code base that you're working in, you can put Markdown in there. Um, if you have a lot of documentation that is not just about the technical pieces of it, you could put Markdown in some other repo. Uh, Confluence, right? it's kind of built for this kind of thing. Uh, and then there's other, another option of like some CMS-y kind of thing, if only we knew of a decent CMS product, uh, you know, there might be possibilities. Uh, when projects start out, it's been my experience across all of them that when, when projects start out, I need no object. Of course we'll confluence things. Confluence is you know, the best thing for creating all this documentation. Right? And then budgets happen. And a year later, whoa, we can't really do confluence anymore. Uh, and I raise this because this happened to me twice. When I first joined the BA project four years ago after it had been already running a year, they had all the documentation in Confluence, and my first task as joining that was to move all that documentation out of Confluence into GitHub Markdown. And then we had a team growth, and a bunch of new people on the team said, we should have Confluence. <laughs> they put it all back in Confluence. Two years later, guess what we did this year? Moved it back out of Confluence into GitHub Markdown, and some other places. Right? It's hard to argue with money. Confluence costs year upon year. Uh, features that promote good documentation, that help us choose which of those tools might be the best. Ease of entry, right? Hands down, that's, right, if you can't enter and, and type out what you're trying to document, uh, you know, that's, that's a definite uh, thing that promotes it. Ease of searching or discoverability, right? Once you've written it, you have to be able to find it. If you can't find it, it might as well not exist. Uh, proximity and availability to its intended audience. Right, if it's written for a developer, let's put it near the developer. If it's written for editors, let's put it near the editors. Uh, bonus points if you can write along with the code. That's, you know, developers give bonus points like that. Hey, if I can write my documentation while I'm submitting my code, great, but it has to write along with it, because otherwise, if the documentation precedes the code, right, then the documentation is lying. It's talking about something that hasn't landed yet. Or if it comes afterwards, right? There's, so there's always this timing mismatch. So if you can have a, a way for it to ride along with the code, that would be uh, a really good thing. Uh, documentation for editors. So on VA, uh, the, C, the Drupal CMS that, we're, that we've built, uh, it services uh, over a thousand editors. Uh, it's a content API that powers VA.gov, and so. Uh, our primary user base within the CMS are the editors themselves, not, uh, it's, it's a totally different team for the most part that's dealing with what does the website look like, we're dealing with the editors. And so we created a, a Drupal content type, just a, a node type, um, that is a knowledge base. And all of the editor related content goes into that. Uh, and it's structured and there's you know, people that are responsible for structuring that, creating how-to guides, uh, and things like that. And that makes it real easy for when you have help text, you can create a link that actually links out to a document that tells you, well, how do I manage operating status for a, for a facility? Right? We can link out to uh, a CMS knowledge base that does that. And that knowledge base, it, it's just a Drupal content type. So you can field it and create it however you want. Uh, it's searchable, it's uh, readily at hand. We're sort of eating our own dog food in that it's in Drupal, it's about Drupal. Um, visibility is sometimes the issue. For us, it's not an issue because our site is not a public, that, that portion of it is not a public site. The rest of the world doesn't see your documentation for editors. Uh, but it's easy enough to exclude that, you know, Drupal permissions, it's easy enough to exclude it from public visibility if, if that uh, is the situation that you're in. 
Uh, um, VA, we have not just a thousand editors, and the CMS is not the only product of the VA. There are hundreds, uh, if not more than hundreds, of VA uh, groups within the VA team. And so uh, VA came up with the idea of having basically just a repo that's a documentation repo. So the VA Gov team repo is over here, where any documentation that's designed for people that aren't actually in the CMS itself goes there. Uh, we have the other CMS repo, as you can see, this uh, just a separate thing over here, and, and this it coincides with the front end. So these are just three of the repos that are, are visible within, within GitHub. Um, bonus points for the VA, all of our repos except for a sensitive one that has security-related stuff, all of them are public. You can fork and you know copy VA.gov if you wanted to, uh, locally spin it up, have access to all its documentation, contribute to its documentation if you're trying to protest. Uh, impress somebody on the team and that, and that you may want to join the team. You can make kind of contributions right, right out of the gate. Uh, VA has been great about that. They've been open since like the beginning of, of this project. <coughs> uh, documentation for site maintainers. Right? So other than that, if we have uh, documentation that is about the site and documentation about like the, the nuts and bolts of the site. Uh, markdown files in the repo are often a great place to put it. Um, power tip, if you uh, have custom modules that do different facets of whatever is happening on your site, the business logic on your site, uh, make the readme in that, uh, in that module, your documentation about that thing. Uh, and with a little bit of code, you can actually connect it up to, to hook help. Uh, the idea being that if you can make all uh, the roads in your CMS lead to the documentation, it makes it that much more discoverable. So if you can get to it through the help page and it takes you there, great. Um, if you can get to it through a link in something else that you can point to that markdown file, great. GitHub automatically you know, renders a markdown file visibly, uh, so you get all the nice formatting and that kind of thing. Uh, this extra code just is if you have the markdown filter installed on your website, it'll actually make it pretty, but. <clears throat> there are other tools out there. Uh, one that we used for quite a while was the Acquia Drupal spec tool. Uh, anybody familiar with that? A couple. Uh, it's basically a, a, a uh, Google Sheet or a set of Google Sheets that you can add fields, you can document all the fields in your, in your uh, CMS and make notes about them and set up all of the you know, machine names that you're going to use. Uh, and the nice part about it is, right, because there's always this risk when you have two sources of, of truth, the documentation and the actual thing, uh, that they can drift, they can get out of sync. This is nice because it actually creates behat tests based on the fields and content types that you enter into it. The behat test, then you just paste into your repository, and there's a setup uh, along with the, the Acquia spec tool, there's a little like connector that connects these behat tests. But it makes it so that your test won't pass if they're not in sync with the spec tool. And that's kind of nice for like keeping, to make sure that your documentation of it is up to date uh, with what's there. We ran into a problem on VA.gov because the way they create the, the way this is created, uh, the hat test, it's a bunch of concatenations. And there's a concatenation limit within uh, Google Sheets. And we hit that after you know, several hundred fields. And so, uh, we took it one step farther and we made an Airtable version of it. And that worked pretty nicely. Uh, except that Airtable gets a little bit, it's kind of like the Confluence thing. It starts costing money, that kind of thing. Uh, but it does, it, it's the same kind of thing. We, we you know, can enter in all the information about the various fields that we have and it will generate um, some behat tests that, that do largely the same thing. Just to make sure the documentation about the thing and the thing actually line up. Uh, so there were pros to this. Uh, pros are it's easy to enter and easy to look up a field. Right? Some of our, our content designers who weren't necessarily like hard into Drupal, uh, into the Drupal interfaces, could see what the fields were and they could audit, hey, where is the phone number field being used in all these places? Does the help text match everywhere? All that kind of thing. Uh, generates its own set of behead tests, talk about that. Um, it's in the, the, the drawback to it, or the power of it, depending on how your releases go, is that it's really intended that 
uh, one person would be sort of the release manager for the fields. So for a given sprint, you might be adding three fields to two different sort of products within your, within your CMS. It really helps if you had one person do that. They would enter it into the spec tool, generate the tests, move the tests over, and add those fields to, the, to Drupal itself. The reason for that, that it's really better if there's one, is that if you have two people, somebody over here adds field A, somebody over here adds field C, uh, B, we won't skip letters, uh, neither of their tests are going to pass. Because when person that added A goes to run those tests, it now includes a test for field B that isn't there, it isn't part of their code base. So there was always sort of this collision where you'd have to like go in and tweak the test, remove the line that was checking for that field. Um, and other stuff uh, the problem with it was that sort of dual source thing, right? We're entering information about fields that are in a Drupal database into another database so that we can have documentation. And that always sort of troubled me, right? I was kind of with the promotion cat here, like, wait a minute, we've got this database. It could generate these things instead of us having to enter them to try to keep them in sync. So it got me thinking about what can I do to like appease the cat, because that's <laughs> just off cat. Uh, so what about another options for uh, documentation for site maintainers? Well, you know, if only, right? If only uh, it could live in Drupal as content. Could, it only could ride along with code changes. Right? Content doesn't usually ride along with code changes. Something doesn't sound right here. Uh, if it was fieldable, so you could document what was important to your business cases, your use cases. Uh, what if it was self-documenting? Okay. What if it helped you see relationships? All right. So you know, pick your pick your like. Do you want to wish on a birthday cake? Do you want to wish on a falling star? Pick one, wish. Okay. So one of the things that uh, I did out of this was created a, a module called the Content Documentation Module, uh, Content Model Documentation Module, uh, and it's a bit of a you know naming things is hard. When I first built this, it was all about hey, this is about the content model, and then it grew a little bit. And it was hey, this is really about documenting your site, but it's too late to change the name of the module, so. There is a little bit of a, of a disconnect. It does a lot more than just the, the content uh, model documentation. Uh, but basically, it creates a, a way for you to document block types, media types, menus, modules, note types, paragraph types, taxonomies. Not everything that you use to build a Drupal site, but a good portion of what you might use to build a Drupal site. It also lets you create site notes, site principles, right, guidance, uh, and site processes. It creates a content model document entity within the CMS. It's not a, it's not a node entity. It's not going to intermingle with your nodes. Right? Editors don't necessarily have to see it. If they go to admin content, they're going to see these. There's a specific view for this. But it's fieldable. And what that gives us the power to do. So on VA, one of the things that we do is we pull a lot of data from other sources. And we migrate that in daily. So information about contact information about VA facilities. We migrate that in daily. And we add stuff to it. So the CMS editors, the editor for that facility, can change the status of that facility. We're closed because the road washed out. They can add that status. We push that status out to another service. So from our point of view, from things that are interesting for the VA's use, is we add fields for data pulled from, data pushed to, right? Because that's something that we want to track. It's fieldable. You can add any, you know, any field that you could add to a content type or a term, right? You could add to a content model document. So we've got, you know, links to our design system, links to, uh, see, we have, we have it split because we have a CMS design that controls what editors see, and then we also have a design of what it shows like on the front end. Uh, links to research, right? We do a lot of our, our stuff is research based, so it helps to have links to the original research. Uh, other links, knowledge base articles, those are for the editors, but we can track what, what is connected to what. Screenshots, um, diagrams, right? anything that we can add as a field, we can add to 
whatever it is that you need to document for your site to make to make your documentation whole and meaningful to you and your constituents and team. <clears throat> uh, the nice thing about this is the documentation lives near the thing that you're documenting. So in this case, if we're managing the fields on a content type benefits detail page, there's a tab. And if you click the documentation tab, you get whatever documentation was written for that. If nobody wrote it, you get page not found. Working on that. Uh, patches are welcome. Uh, but so basically, it, it puts it near the thing that you're working with. If you're documenting a term, or a, a, a vocabulary, it puts it near the vocabulary. If you're documenting a menu, right? it puts it near the menu. So the documentation rides along with what you're doing. It can be accessed in other ways, but it's handy there, right? Again, the, the idea of making all the roads lead to the documentation. The other thing that, that this brings along with it is a customizable view, an actual view of these content model documents. So again, if there's something that you want to surface that's important, you can add it like you can add something to any view. So in this case, we want it to be able to easily find hey, where are we pulling or where are we pushing data to within this view and be able to filter by it and, and find it. And so again, this is a customizable view. It comes in with literally just the name uh, and the documentation for field in the edit. Everything else beyond that is pretty much custom, but it's a, it's a view. You can bend it to your, to your will and desires. <clears throat> uh, it also gives you a content model fields view. Now there is a field view in core that just sort of lists all the fields. This does that, but it you know does a little bit more. Um, and again, this is fieldable. So if there's something additional that you want to track, it's a it's a view. So you can decide what you want to track on that field if it's important for you uh, to know the language, but not the cardinality. You can adjust the view uh, as needed to again to suit your needs. Um, it also provides a view that's not customizable, but is a monster in terms of being able to drill down into things. Right? If you want to know what fields use a certain callback, <laughs> this will surface it. Uh, this was actually contributed, so this is the cool thing about Drupal. This was contributed by uh, Matteo Scarset. Uh, he had created a module that, that did this, and I said, that's awesome. I would love to have it be part of this. And in like awesome Drupal fashion, he's like, great, let's do it. And the next day, he had ported his new module that didn't have anybody using it yet over to this one. Um, so you never know what you get until you, until you ask. And now he's involved with, uh, with this uh, content model documentation module as well. Uh, and this has been a, a great addition to it, because it really, from a developer's point of view, you can like find anything you want about fields that are in use. Wouldn't it be nice if you had diagrams that showed entity relationships, how one, one node connects to a different kind of node, uh, uh, or term, or whatever. Uh, again, this is another case of talk to other developers. Right? This was being uh, constructed by another Civic Actions team that was uh, working on the National Science Foundation. And I said, this would be great to have in content model documentation module. A few days later, ported it over to that, so now this comes out of the box. You can select uh, from you know, basically any entity that Drupal knows about. You can make connections, and it will surface any entity references uh, in either direction uh, to those things. So it, it makes it easy to discover your content type, or to represent your content type. Uh, it doesn't show here, but one of the cool things out of this is that there, on this page, if the screen capture went a little bit farther down, there's a link where you can actually copy this mermaid markup. And if you haven't explored mermaid yet, but you can copy and paste mermaid into GitHub comments or GitHub issues. And so if you wanted to like change this, you can get the editable mermaid text, plop it into GitHub, and you have this formatted graph in there already, uh, which is kind of fun, because then you can play around with things and show what changes should be made. Uh, there's also helpful related reports that come along with the module, things like, um, you know, content types, right? How many, are, how many are there of a specific content type? How many are published? How many are unpublished? Just lets you sort of see the, the health or, I guess, the makeup of your site. How am I doing here? <clears throat> so 
Now that you know, you've seen some of the tools that might be possible, now we come down to well, what should we document? Okay. From my point of view, the, the biggest question that, that like, almost always gets lost is the why. Why are we doing this? Uh, and the reason for that is, like, I'm a developer. The code tells me the truth most of the time. But it almost never tells me why. Even if I've created it and should have created a comment in that code to tell me why, I forgot to do it at the time. And it's not there for me now when I'm you know, trying to remember. Uh, so documenting the why is kind of like the most critical thing. Uh, and again, as a developer, when you're kind of in the weeds of, of banging out the code to solve a problem, you forget to leave that breadcrumb of the why, or at least I do, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's just me. Uh, but why is the one thing that good code can't usually tell you? Uh, it can tell you how, and it can tell you the various cases, but not the why. Why gives you the context for everything that comes after it. Uh, and in doing that, right, the, that context sometimes comes down to decisions. Right? When we first built the, the CMS for, for VA.gov, Drupal 8 was pretty much brand new. Some of the decisions that were made about what modules we're going to use or whatever came down to they weren't available yet, or they weren't even out of alpha, or right? Now, you look back and it's like, well, there was a module for that. Well, it didn't exist then. Right, but we can address some of that. Um, and lots of times there are things that seem like obvious solutions, but they may only seem that way because you're looking at them after the fact. Somebody that was in the trenches at the time, making that choice in the, of the solutions, right? They had a bigger context or more context at the time. And so this is just an example, right? Uh, if we reviewed six modules for a way to do something, why did we choose the one we did? Right? There may have been good reasons. Right? I was around when these choices were made. If I left the team, nobody would remember why we didn't choose these. And so the next person that comes on news says, well, why didn't you choose the markdown field? That would be the right thing to do. Right? Now there's a, a bit of a, a history left behind. Uh, what should you document? Right? The skeletons in your closet. Not your personal skeletons, leave those where they are, but like the skeletons of the code the skeletons of like things that you're embarrassed of, right? Like we build things the best we can at the time we're building them, but sometimes they don't age well. When you look back at them a couple of years later, you're like, right? But those are the things that you almost need to document to say why, to say how, right? So don't be afraid to document the skeletons. It's not as though like admitting them makes them worse. Uh, risky stuff. So this is an actual, uh, from VA.gov, this is an actual content model document site note that I created to remind myself and anybody else on the team not to update node access by look update. It doesn't work, it fails, creates a problem. Uh, so yeah. if, it's, if you know when, it, when you run into a pitfall, document it, it's, it's easy. New, you know, new site note, boop, 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 done. Uh, the trick is naming it so other people will find it. I figured if I used caution and danger and warning enough, somebody would, would search that. Dragons they might not search for. What else should you document? Weird stuff, like what is that? Uh, unexpected stuff, right? Things that were unexpected that, that came up. Uh, not only stuff, if it took you more than two days to figure out what was going on, you probably ought to document it. Right? If it took you more than two days to create, what is now going on, it makes sense to spend a bit of that time to document. Uh, exceptions that you know you won't remember in a year. I tend to doubt my memory a lot, so it's easy for me to go, I'm not gonna remember that in a year. 10 years ago, I'll remember that, I remember, right? But then you, you find yourself a year later, going, I don't know, I don't remember why that happened. Um, so this, this is a real, it's like, like, it sounds easy, but it's actually pretty hard to, to think about what won't I remember. Um, document complex problems with mermaid. So one of the things that comes along with this is a dependency on a mermaid field module that makes a mermaid field available. So that, uh, and again, if you haven't used mermaid, it's, it's kind of a cool, uh, relatively easy way to make diagrams. And so as part of the documentation for us using system banner alerts that we send updates to gov delivery, right? MailChimp for gov kind of thing. Um, Right, there's a, for us it's a fairly complex process because we don't want to send out notifications uh, to Gov Delivery before it lands on the front end. 
because then we'd be saying, hey, go visit this alert, and it's not there yet. Uh, so we have a kind of a, an integrated step between our, our decoupled front end and our uh, CMS to control when we send out these code delivery notices. Well, that process is kind of like it's, it's really hard to spell out in paragraphs of text, but this can make it, and you're only seeing part of it, it goes on. Uh, but a diagram can really help sort of clarify things there. Um, the other nice part is that it's easy to create connections to other documentation, to other things that affected this. So research, uh, this goes back to some of the fields I was showing. Um, you know, basically things that would support the understanding of that. Uh, it's, uh, it's the web, create links. Uh, what should you document? Standards and processes, right? Again, our focus is the editors, we have probably in the neighborhood of 60 views that serve editors a variety of ways. We created a best practices for, you know, what should every view have? If you have a view and it has these filters, what order should the filters on be on that page so that every editor, you know, when they land on something with, it, with filters, they sort of know it because if they're familiar with one, they're familiar with the other. Uh, so we came up with a, a, a style guide for documenting what views should look like. Conclusions on this, right? Leave good clues for your, for your future selves, your future team. Uh, the story of your site really shouldn't have cliffhangers. It should be a pretty boring story. It shouldn't have cliffhangers, it shouldn't have mysteries. It should be just kind of a boring history, uh, sadly to say. Um, hopefully, right, content model documentation module could help you do this for your site. You don't have to use that. Like I said, there's other products out there that can do it. Um, and so that's kind of a, the, uh, the conclusion there. Questions at all? Me? Yes. I have, I have a few. Um, sure. One, does it work with Drupal 10? Oh. Yes. Okay. Um, can you, for that module, can you have different documentation for different roles? Like if you have two permission levels of content creators, can they see different documentation or like one per? Uh, the permissions on the, on the Content model documentation is just it's one permission that you that right. you either assign like two versions for different roles like yeah that Andrew? that could be added but it's okay. not it's not, it's not out of the box okay. um, and is my other question so we use things so we similarly have sites where in the back end we have varying levels of content creators and different types of roles doing stuff unrelated to like the front end users. And so we have, we use like Zendesk or something for the front end folks and then we end up kind of quasi doing that and giving a buttload of like manuals that we create in Google Docs and stuff like that for even folks in the back end. Um, and so is there, I'm curious, is there any sort of like export on these to be able to create something that could also live outside that we need to deliver um, to somebody to use outside of the site? Uh, yes, yes and no. There is an export that's built into this that I didn't cover for the for the technical people. Um, once you create a content model document, so if you create it locally, there is a Drush command to export it as a YAML file, okay. and then there's a command that you can use in a hook update to import it, so it ends up on your production site. That isn't really what you're right. asking yeah. about. Um, no, there there isn't. But patches are welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, just to your left there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I, I would, one of the, I, I love the work that you've done on this. I know that, because um, when I was working on the configuration management system in Drupal 8, one of my dreams was always that the configuration that's being created for the content models would be used for the tools like this. And when I think about like exporting this information out into other tools, that's something that I would encourage people to look at because the configuration is, as you say, YAML files that are machine readable and predictable and structured. And so I've been doing some experimentation, for instance, with a client right now where we're taking exports of the configuration and working it into their documentation, which is done using a static site generator, and bringing that data <laughs> into the templates. Because again, it's self-documented. You shouldn't have to duplicate enter this information. If you update Drupal, the configuration gets exported and that data gets brought into their static site generator. And so 
it's just another, like I would encourage anybody here who's a developer who's interested in this topic to think about the ways they can use Drupal's own self-documenting pro products, whether it be the database or the configuration or whatever, to build tools for their clients in this way. Um, another thing that you brought up that I think is really important is whether this documentation should be public or not. And while I understand why a lot of the stuff sh shouldn't necessarily be public, I would really encourage everyone, especially in the Gov space, to publish their content models. Because the content models that people are building is such useful information and examples. And if you're being successful for other people, like for instance, I recently worked with the state of Massachusetts on a product, and their entire CMS documentation is all public. And I love it because I now, when I'm working with other state governments, can point to that and say, here's a place where this has been successful and here's what they used and what do you think about the model that's here? And, and it's like sharing that learning and bringing it forward to everybody is, is a really big deal. Um, just to uh, pivot off of what you said, um, we are actually working with Steve to build that static site. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, we got together because their approach was, we have an existing site we want to document. Right. And our approach was, we don't have a site. We want to document a site and we want to use the content types that we've created to create the documentation and to create document that we can get sign off from the client right. that is versioned. Yep. And so the idea is um, use, the doc use a brand new Drupal site with CM documentation installed with some additional tweaks and changes to create the content types and then press a button where we're exploring Tome right now that could export a static site that has all of the documentation on it, mm -hmm. which we can then put into a GitHub repo that creates a GitHub pages site, which is version controlled. Right. So the client could then come to that website, see all the documentation that we are planning for the new site, and sign off on it. And then when we make changes on the site, we just export a second version of that static site, re-upload it to uh, GitHub pages, and there's a new version, and you can literally go backwards and forwards and see the dips. Yeah, I guess the difference between what I'm doing and what you're doing is I'm just using it directly from Drupal's configuration rather than an export from the model. The model so, so, so it's fundamentally Drupal it's config. Fundamentally, yeah, exactly. And so we're doing, we're using both, so we should right. definitely talk about <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Our Drupal site, like they've built modules and then actually wireframes, and I'm putting content into the modules. How do I ask to see if there's already, because like I made my own visual representation of what I put into the site, but how do I ask the actual developers if this documentation is out there and where should I see it? Like, how do I ask for that? Starting with the word, please. I, I, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Like you just say, do we have a site where this is documented? Can I see it? Like, is uh, sorry, maybe I'm misunderstanding. You're asking about asking your developers yes. for their documentation. Yes, of our okay. site, if that exists already. Because I've been doing my own kind of ad hoc. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you know it's kind of a team norm sort of thing that you'd have to ask your team. Like, okay. hey, this, you know, I, I see this thing that you built. Where can I find out more about it? And you yeah, hope the answer is talk to Colonel, talk to Colonel Conlon. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. <laughs> who who actually? Yeah. Because if there's already something set up that can that is generating that for me, like I would just use that. Right. And I didn't mean to give the impression that it all auto generate. Like you still have to write oh, sure. a bunch of stuff, but yeah. uh, but some of it, you know, the part that it can pull out of field yeah. information is self documenting. But just asking that question can be like very transformative on a team. Okay. Right, because now you're setting an expectation, essentially, of I'd like to be able to see documentation, right? And that, well, I'd like to, you know, nobody wants to disappoint. I'd like to be able to deliver documentation. Other questions? So, um, I was wondering, what are your thoughts about uh, tools like Storybook or Pattern Lab to express like front-end components? I don't know if that's part of your documentation process. Uh, it is. We actually use uh, Storybook. Um, it's a little bit more on the front end side of things, so I'm not all that involved with it, but we do use Storybook, and in some cases our documentation links to the Storybook representation of that field or that collection of fields, that paragraph, whatever. So, in my mind, it fits perfectly with that. 
And I just wanted to answer her question. So I'm the developer on my, you know, <laughs> with my content managers and the people who, have, you know, and one of the things they've asked me was like, you know, can we create an internal style guide? So that's one thing you can ask them to do. Give me a page, you know, that you, I mean, I don't know what your setup is. We, we are very paragraph heavy. We use a lot of components on our website. So I basically built that for them. Yeah. Um, and then of course, documentation of each of the fields. And video trainings. I don't, you know, there's a lot of yeah, We have a couple. It's like that our site was done first, and we got used for a lot of trainings, which I thought was kind of funny. So I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, but yes, by all means, use that to train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other questions? What is the $20 content model we're working for? Oh, <laughs> <I'm glad> <laughs> Um, first, before I jump into that, uh, Civic Actions is giving away a pair of uh, Bose 700 noise canceling headphones. There's the, the QR code if anybody wants that. Uh, the link takes you to like Greenhouse. It says up to a resume. You don't have to. That's just <laughs> something that could make go away. But anyway, uh, $20 content model report request challenge. Good question. So I'm out of ideas. I have a bunch of reports that content model documentation module creates. I need to crowdsource some ideas. I'm willing to pay for a couple of them. Uh, so come up with an idea for a content model report that is generic enough that you think it would be useful for any site, not just your site, right? Don't tell me about the one widget on your site you want to track. But something that you think would be helpful across all of that. Uh, submit a feature request on the content model documentation module, uh, issue queue. Put in a comment, something like, I saw Florida man at Drupal, uh, GovCon, yeah, I'm from Florida. Uh, and if anybody says Florida man has done something bad, it's Mike Herschel, it's not me. Uh, <laughs> and at the uh, at, uh, close of day Sunday, I'll look at anything that was, was suggested and I'll pick the top two. Top two will get uh, $20 that I'll sell you. Uh, and you don't have to do it for the money either, but. Uh, Figure it's worth a try. So, if you have ideas about, hey, this would be a really nice thing to know about my site that's not too specific, please pass the ideas along. And really, any other feature requests, I'm open and do a lot of work on this module. So, if you have something in mind, definitely feel empowered because you are here to submit feature requests or patches. Definitely patches. Uh, some example of reports, just to like give you some clarity, because we didn't really cover reports all that much. Right? There's a report on users and roles, and again, this is leveraging Mermaid to create some some diagrams that give me an idea of what does this look like? What are these roles? How, how do they break down? Uh, content model uh, uh, moderation, so workflow. Right? There's another report that you can pick the workflow that you're at. You can pick the the states that you want to see, and it'll show you how you can move from, from one state to another. Uh, and there's also one that's uh, enabled modules. Uh, sometimes we get people that like want to know what modules are installed on the site, but we don't want to give them uh, access to the modules page, because that's kind of bad. This is a report. Gives you pretty much all the same information. Has uh, useful links to the project pages, the help, uh, the help page, if there is one, uh, and the content model document, if one exists for that module. Because the other thing you can document is, why are we using this module? What is this module doing for us? And so that, that document link will show up there. You can see we haven't documented all of ours. Uh, and it tell you when they were added? Uh, it does not, but that would be cool. That would be good too. Yeah. <laughs> um, like a 20 book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you get that information out of other than to record it, like when you add it. So here, here's the idea that, that like I would put in on my team now. If you're adding a module, I would expect now, since content model documents can ride along with that code, I would expect there to be, at this point, a content model document that goes along with that, and that could tell you when it was added. Right? That could give you the history of why are we using this. What, right? And that can ride along the same code that brings that module into your code base could bring that content model document into your code base. It'd be cool if this showed if there were available updates for a module too. Yeah. Right, there's a page for that, isn't there? <laughs> huh? There's a page for that. Oh, that's right. There is. And, 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 and this could be public, right? Yeah, because this, this could public. be permed exactly. to be public. Exactly. 
We don't necessarily want to review no, that. I, I was just thinking about it from the perspective of, because I was just thinking about it from the modules page perspective, but I, you're right, there is an opportunity for that, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, no more questions. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.